bless each and every one of you today. We thank you again for joining in with us. Uh, I want to welcome you. I just want you to know that um, we have the opportunity to look to the Lord and His Word in moments like these. We find comfort in His scriptures. I want to read today from the book of Philippians chapter 1. From Philippians chapter 1. Paul, starting from verse Number 12 states, But I will, ye shall understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. And many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Verse 15. Some indeed preach Christ, even of envy and strife, and some also of goodwill. I want to speak to you today on a topic that I know many of you are a bit antsy about, and it's called lockdown. Lockdown. L O C K. D-O-W-N. It's defined as a state of isolation or restricted access instituted as a security measure. I'm going to repeat that. Limited access, restriction, restricted access, instituted as a security measure. I know we use terms like quarantine, but I think lockdown may be easier for us to understand. It can also refer to isolation. If you have the virus, normally they will put you in isolation. Let me give you an example. The university is on lockdown and nobody has been able to leave. Some of you may feel as though you are locked down or locked in in your very home. We hear terms like stay at home, shelter in place, quarantine, but it also used as the confining of prisoners to the cells, typically after an escape or to regain control during a riot. Everything is shut down. All doors are locked. All windows are shut. It seems as though there is no escape. I listen to the stories and I can understand how you feel that you have not been able to do the things that you are accustomed to doing. For example, coming in and fellowship amongst the brethren in the church, being able to hug and shake hands and to just participate in worship, to hear the lively music, the fiery testimonies, and to see, you know, pastors and teachers get excited and passionate about what they're teaching and preaching about. The question is lockdown that you may have is when will it end? We've taken our children on several trips, and I remember some as far as Canada and uh, Toronto, Canada, some as far as Florida. I live in New Jersey. And I could tell you that they will ask us, are we there yet? They're eager and anxious to get to the point where they can get out and just live their regular lives, have fun, play games when they were smaller. You may be saying today, when will this end? Are we there yet? And I understand as restrictions are lifted in certain states, I don't believe there's any state today in the United States that has fully opened up where you can just go anywhere you want to without a mask, without six feet restrictions. Those restrictions are still there. So you still feel as though you're locked in. What does the Bible have to say about that? And how does that relate to you where you are? Well, I want you to see in the scripture, the Bible tells us about people being locked up, different than being locked down. Joseph, if you recall, uh, Joseph was a dreamer. He was the 11th son of Jacob, known as Israel. And um, his mom died in, in childbirth, and 
you know, with Benjamin, his youngest brother. And, and so Jacob, I mean, so Joseph grew up having a gift of dreaming, and he would share his dream um, to others, and people would think, well, you know, he think he's all that, his head is in the clouds, and I'm sure that his brothers made fun of him because Joseph's dream positioned him to be the leader, to be a leader. He was special to his father, Jacob. And when the older brothers went out to take care of the flock, one day, Dad Jacob said, Joseph, go give me a report. I believe that Joseph was a straight and arrow shooter. He told it as it is. He didn't mince words. You know, he had, a, I will say, a flair about him. If you recall, Joseph had a special coat, and that coat was very colorful. The brothers had coat too, but this one, I believe, was the most colorful. When they saw him coming, they said, here comes the dreamer. They decided, look, you know, we're competing against this guy. He's daddy's favorite. We're going to take care of him. And they decided to kill him. But they put him in a, in a well. And they were waiting to really slay him. But the oldest decided, look, I'm not going to let his blood be on my shoulder. I'm going to just relieve him. And while he was out, they saw a group of people on their way to Egypt. And he was sold as a slave to the Ishmaelites. I want you to understand this, though, that Joseph is, at this age, 17. I mean, he had people doing everything for him. His father was fully wealthy. He had, you know, servants. He didn't have to work hard. And he's now sold as a slave. Part of her decided to choose him. And he started to work as a slave in part of his house. Now, the Bible doesn't give us exactly how many years he worked in part of his house. But what we do know that even while he was serving as a slave in the house of a man who had some authority and he's a dignitary in Pharaoh's, you know, government, God showed him favor. He had freedom to move around the house. They recognized there was something unique and different about Joseph. And I believe what they noticed was the anointing of God, that the Holy Spirit equipped Joseph to not just dream, but to interpret dreams. He was promoted. And I believe now he's seen God, you finally, something good has happened. He's now no longer moving things around, but he's now manager. He is managing the entire affairs of part of his house. That was going well until part of his wife noticed that Joseph most likely carried himself with, a, with an air, with distinction, the way he spoke, and she wanted him for herself. And we know what happened, that she said, lie with me. Joseph refused. He ran out of the house after she set the stage. When the owner, or the husband of the house came back, Joseph was thrown in prison. And Joseph was thrown in prison because Potiphar was embarrassed. He knew Joseph was speaking the truth because he never, Joseph never gave Potiphar the opportunity to disbelieve him because of his ethic, his work ethic. So most people will see, see this as a setback. That's the first lockup. He's thrown in prison. There is no history of a trial. He's not accused of a crime. And he's just living in prison. We know that even in prison, God showed Joseph favor. How do we know that? Well, we realize that the Bible says that Joseph was put in charge of all the prisoners. 
What was God doing with Joseph? God was developing Joseph's leadership skills. First, he was leader in one man's house. Then he's leader of an entire prison. And you know folks who were thrown in prison, I don't believe all of them was as saintly as Joseph. I believe they did some wrong stuff. Joseph was able to handle them. The prison warden, or guard, I mean, in charge of the prison, he saw something unique in Joseph. And I believe that was the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We don't know exactly how long Joseph stayed in prison, but some scholars believe it was about 10 years. How do I know that? We know that two years before he came out of prison, two prisoners came in from Pharaoh's you know, palace, a baker and a butler. And one day he saw them, they looked very distraught, they both had dreams. And Joseph interpreted the dream for the first one. When he heard the account, he interpreted the butler's dream and said, you know, Pharaoh's going to restore you and you're going to be a cupbearer and you're going to be, you know, back doing your regular job. So the other guy who had a dream said, well, if he interpreted it and it's a good outcome, let me share mine. He was the baker. He gave the baker the interpretation and said, Pharaoh's going to come and release you, but you're going to be killed. Just as Joseph mentioned, Joseph said, when you are released, remember me, two years, I mean two long years, went by. So if you put in the time, it's approximate, it's about 10 years that Joseph stayed in prison for a crime he did not commit. He thought it was unfair. But I want you to see how God positioned him. God kept him in place. Lockdown means you're restricted. Lockdown means that you don't have the freedom to do the things you once did. And I'm here to tell every believer today, God has a plan, God has a purpose, and God would bless you if you utilize this time so that you can get closer to him. If you utilize this time to develop your leadership skills, to spend more time in his presence, to read his word, to catch up on things that you should be doing that prior to COVID-19 and, and quarantine and lock, you know, like lockdown, you were not doing. Why? Why is that important? Why is that important? Here's what I want you to understand why it's important. Because I want you to see this, that when he was 30 years old, when Pharaoh started, had this dream, recurring dream, and no one was able to interpret the dream, the magician, the, the scientists, all these astrologers that could not interpret Pharaoh's dream. As a matter of fact, they couldn't even give him his dream. I want you to understand, though, that's when the butler, rightly positioned in the midst of Pharaoh, saw the disgust that Pharaoh couldn't rest, all of a sudden, his memory bank was activated. What if Joseph was released from prison? Do you think that they would have been able to find him? No. In retrospect, you can see that God kept Joseph in prison for two extra years. Because when he was needed to interpret Pharaoh's dream, the butler knew exactly where he was. I remember this Hebrew in this prison. He was sent, he took a, you know, he was shaved, he changed his clothes, and he appeared before Pharaoh, and the rest is history. Joseph moved from being a slave, despised prior by his brothers, sold into slavery, accused wrongfully of a crime he did not commit, Yet God lifted him up into leadership position in a place that you may consider to be H-E double hockey stick, prison. And when the right time came, Joseph was prepared to step into the biggest leadership position in all of Egypt, second only to King Pharaoh. God prepared him. 
I believe it was painful for him, but he benefited from it. I want you to also understand that for about three and a half years, we spoke about him last week at one of the Elijah with a J. Yeah, he, when he made a comment, it's not going to rain until I say so. It's not going to rain until I say so. Before the king Ahab, he had to go hide. God took him away. We knew and we know that the Lord took care of him by the, you know, the birds of the air and the brook, the brook that had water, and that dried up. He could have easily said, God, what now? Until God led him to Zarephath. And he stayed there for at least three years, being sustained by a widow woman who was a Gentile. I want you to understand this. When the right time came, he showed his face to Ahab, and, A, and, and I want you to see Elijah with a J declared it will rain even when there was no evidence of rain. Three and a half years, he was in hiding. I will call that he was in lockdown. He was in lockdown. Let's go to the New Testament. Paul, we read about in the book of Philippians Chapter 1, verses, really verse 12 and 13 and 14. What I want you to see about Paul is that he too was in lockdown. He was arrested. Paul was placed under house arrest. He had the freedom to move around, but he was not thrown in jail. The first arrest of Paul, um, basically he was in lockdown. I want you to see this, that what will you accomplish in lockdown? What did you, or what have you accomplished, or what will you accomplish during this time of lockdown? Is this a time for me to grow, or is it a time for me to complain? Is it a time for me to get anxious? Do I believe that God doesn't care about me anymore? Has God forgotten me? Joseph felt that maybe God had forgotten him. But I want you to know that God doesn't have problems with his, with his memory. So Paul's first lockdown was in Rome. And he accomplished two things during that time. First, he wrote the first full letters that impacted the lives of people and still do even today. If Paul was not locked down, he will not have had the time to write these letters. These letters are what we have in the book called the Bible. There are 27 books in the New Testament. Paul is given 13 of those. And if you, some people include, um, you know, Hebrews. In Hebrews, we say the author is unknown. So if you think Paul wrote Hebrews, then that will be 14. That means that about half or more than half of the books of the New Testament were written by one man who was in lockdown because of the message of Christ that he was preaching. I want you to understand the impact that that has on our world today. In the United States of America, prior to, to COVID-19, on an average day, 168,000 Bibles are sold every day. The average of Bibles sold in America every single day is 168,000 prior to COVID-19 lockdown. Maybe it's more, maybe it went up, I'm not sure. How many lives do you believe that Paul, in his writing of his first four letters, impact on people today? These writings are Ephesians. In that order of, written, of writing, Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon, or Philemon. So it depends on how you pronounce it. What I want you to see, though, is that these letters have impacted so many of us today. He answered questions, but he did it from a lockdown position. 
And what I want you to un also understand, not only did Paul write letters, the second thing that Paul did when he was locked down, he used the time to share his faith. And that's the premise of the scripture that we read from Philippians chapter 1, verses 12, 13, and 14. I want you to understand, though. Let me read it from another translation so you can understand it. Here's what it says. Paul said, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. That's verse 12. Verse 13. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. Maybe, just maybe, God allowed these doors to be closed. I'm referring to the churches. God has, you know, cut or actually caused us not to have the time to fellowship in masses as we used to so that we can rethink, reformat ourselves so that many lives will be touched. I could tell you from the reviews that we've had, and I look at the report on a weekly basis, we have been able to touch by far more souls during this COVID-19 period than we've ever touched before as a church. We have on average over 10,000 people view our broadcast every week. We have the privilege now, and I'm directly involved in this as well, where our church provide, and we've done food pantry, we've been doing this for six, seven years, but in, in our Trenton campus. But I want you to understand that every week we serve over 350 to 450 families consistently every week since this pandemic started. We are impacting more people. We are leading more people to Christ. We see more people who have backslidden come back to the faith in Christ than we've ever seen before. So I want you to understand the next time you feel like murmuring and complaining, the next time you feel, well, you know, I should just go ahead and do what I want to do. I don't care. God was going to protect me. Maybe, just maybe, God has us on lockdown to accomplish a few things. Maybe you need to pick up the phone and make that call and call a loved one, someone you have not connected with in quite a while. Maybe you need to send a text message, a scripture, a word of encouragement to somebody letting them know that you're praying for them, you care for them, you love them, you forgive them. Maybe, just maybe, this lockdown is meant for you to do something more than you've done before. Here's what I want you to understand. You may say, well, how did he do it? Let me break it down for you. Some of you recall that we did what is called the prayer watch, right? And we talked about how those Roman soldiers um, changed, you know, the, the watch of, the, you know, of their time, different from the Jewish. So they have their four-hour watches, really, right? So they moved it from two to four. It was three at one point, but it moved it up to four hours. That meant in 24 hours, and these imperial guards, you know, the Bible speaks about those that, you know, the pal palace guards you will see in the King James Version, they stayed with Paul. These are elite soldiers that have been assigned to Paul. And Paul didn't just sit there wringing his hand and, oh my God, I can't believe this happened to me. No, Paul didn't do that. Paul used that time. Every four hours, a new guard will come in. They will change shift. The other one will go get rest and do whatever. So in one day, he will see six different guards. And every single one, Paul saw, Paul shared with them his story. He told them how he encountered Jesus Christ on the way to Damascus. He told them how he persecuted the church. He told them what Christ did in his life, how he transformed him, how he saved him, how he filled him with the Holy Spirit. 
And I believe as Paul started to share the good news with those who heard him, I believe there was a response. I believe that they too now heard it. They took that message and they shared it with others. And so before you know it, these same soldiers who heard the message of Paul, who actually responded by accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, before you know it, that many lives were being touched. He's in one place in lockdown, but due to that discipleship program, Paul was able to touch and reach people who he will never been able to reach prior because of his lockdown, because of his you know, ministry. Here's what I want you to understand how important it is. Paul shared his testimony. When was the last time you shared your testimony? How did you come to know Jesus Christ? How did you know about Jesus? I'm not just sharing your testimony, look what happened to me, but I believe that Paul shared with them what God did for me, he would do for you. I want you to also note, I want you to also understand this, that over a two-year period that Paul was in lockdown, over a two-year period that Paul was in lockdown, he led scores of, this, of soldiers to Christ. These soldiers went back and spread the good news to the Roman Empire. So let me ask you the question. In your lockdown, do you believe that God is speaking to you? In your stay-at-home, your shelter-in place? Do you believe God wants, to, what does God want to accomplish in you? Another scripture that Paul uses, the book of Philippians chapter 5, if you can go there with me. Um, Ephesians, rather, chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. In the book of Ephesians chapter 5, you know, we have Galatians and then we have Ephesians. He wrote Galatians as well, but these first four books was when he was in lockdown. Ephesians chapter 5, verse number 15. Paul right into the church. Actually, let's read from verse 14. He said, wherefore, he said, awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Verse 15 is a key verse I want to point out to you. He said, and at 15 and 16, he says, see then that you walk circumspectly, and I'll break that, down, that word down for you before, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. And in verse 17, he says, Wherefore, be ye not unwise. In other words, don't be a fool. But understand what the will of the Lord is. And there are so many Christians. And I pray to God, I ask God that you will get the message that I'm taking time to share with you today, that in your lockdown, God has, I believe, allowed us to be on lockdown because he's trying to do something in us. He wants to do something through us. He wants to do something in us, through us, for his kingdom, for his namesake. Because I believe we've fallen asleep. I believe we've become indifferent and cold as a body. I believe we become lukewarm. And I believe some have left the faith. And I believe that we have been chosen for such a time as this to make a difference. He wants us to make a difference. Let me read it from another translation. Be, caref be very careful then. How you live, not as unwise, but as wise. Second, that's Ephesians 5, verse 15. Verse 16, making the most of every opportunity. Making the most of every opportunity. Because the days are evil. Verse 17, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Or what the Lord's will is. Do you understand God's will? Do you understand the time in which we're living in? Do you understand that this earth is having some earth pains? <laughs> and we're about to bring forth something. We are in a period, a dispensation that I believe is soon coming of the Messiah. And we, the bride, ought to get ready. 
So what do you believe that God wants to accomplish in you and through you? Remember, you're not alone. God has not forsaken you. God has not forgotten you. You know, Israel Hutton wrote a song and sang this song. You know, I am not forgotten. You know, he knows my name. I want you to remember that God knows who you are. And I'm reminded of his word, and, and you know, we've been using this as a, as a, as a scripture, you know, text for this week, um, you know, from the book of, uh, you know, Isaiah chapter 41 and verse number 10. I want to just read that for you um, so that you can understand it. Isaiah chapter 41 and verse number 10. Isaiah chapter 41 and verse number 10. I'll give you a little chance so you can find it as well. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10, it will be on, on your screen as well. But here's what I want you to see, what God's word says. Here's a promise of God. God is speaking to his children Israel, and here's what he said to them. So do not fear. I'm reading from a different translation. For I am with you. <laughs> God is saying, don't be afraid. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of shelter in place. Don't be afraid of COVID-19. Don't be afraid how long it takes. I mean, if you look at Joseph, he was in prison for at least 10 years. It, 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 about 10 years. If, if you look at, you know, prophets like Elijah, three and a half years. You look at Saul, who became Paul, his name was changed to Paul. I mean, he was in and out. He ended up going in prison. And the Bible says, do not be dismayed, for I am your God. And God said, I will strengthen you and help you. God said, I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. Or put it another way, my righteous right hand. What is this scripture telling us? God is saying in his word that he will never leave us. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. What I want you to see, though, that God made a promise then to, the old, in the, to his people of the Old Testament, and he makes a promise now in the New Testament. If you look in the book of Hebrews chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 13, and you look at verse number 5, you will see the word of God reminding us of what Jesus promised, what God said in his word. He says, don't allow your conversation to be about covetousness. Don't worry, and that's what I think most people are worried about. Well, Pastor, I'm not, I'm not too worried about the virus. Either I had it or, I mean, you know, I believe I'm healthy. I'm not going to die from it. So I'm not worried about the virus. I'm worried about keeping my house. I'm worried about paying for my car. I'm worried about my job. And God's word says don't, don't, don't allow that to be your determining factor. Because if you believe God saved you, if you believe God is your daddy, he's your Abba, he's your father, I, and you've been faithful to him, I believe God will be faithful to you. The Bible said, don't allow your conversation or let your conversation be without covetousness. And here's what God says. And be content with the things that you already have. The things you already have, thank God for it. Stop murmuring. For he had said, here's what God says. Here's what God says. I, I just quoted it from Isaiah 41 verse 10. God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. <laughs> there is no if. This is as powerful and as forceful and as, I mean, you cannot, there is no words that can make me believe that God will leave me alone. That he has my back, my front, my side, my center, my top, my bottom. God has me covered. He said, I will never leave you. 
nor forsake you. You can see with boldness in verse 6, he said that the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. I want you to, folks, I've seen so many, and I don't listen or look at them anymore. You see all these things about, well, the vaccine is going to have the mark of the beast and the antichrist, folks, that is nonsense. Don't ever allow yourself to be, you know, pulled in these directions by all this stuff. That's wasting your time. It is fill, filling your mind with doubt and fear. I want you to get into this book of books. I want you to take the time and read the letters that Paul wrote to the church. I want you to read them over and over again until they get into your spirit. I believe some of us need to start memorizing these scriptures because soon and soon maybe these will be taken from us. We need to know the word. Let it become part of us. Here's what I want you to understand. I want you to understand this, that God said in his word, I will not leave you. I'm your helper. God said, I'm here to help you. Well, you see, when God is in heaven, he's, at, he's seated in his throne. How can God help us? Well, we have God the Spirit. Uh, Jesus promised, I will not leave you without a helper. I will not leave you without a comforter. It is expedient for me to go, and when I go, he's going to come. The Father's going to send him to you. And I'm here to tell you that the Holy Spirit that every believer has is in you. He's in you. He is in you, not it. He is a person. He can speak. He has emotions. He can grieve. I'm here to tell you he's here to speak to you, to teach you, to instruct you, to help you get through this COVID-19. So you're on lockdown. You're in lockdown. And I want you to understand, and my final scripture, uh, maybe the last two scriptures I'm going to share with you today, is taken from the book of Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. And here's what God's word said in Matthew 28, 20. Jesus gave the disciples a command in verse 28. In verse 28, Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. 28, he said, look, you know, I, I, I am, here I am, I'm, you know, I'm he, I have authority. And then in verse, you know, 28 and, you know, um, 28, verse 19 and 20, rather, uh, verse 19, Matthew 28, verse 19 and 20, he tell them in verse 19, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And then he mentioned to them, he that believe and is baptized in them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 20, he left something very important. He gave them a task, and though he was going away, he let them know that he was not abandoning them. Those of you who feel so alone and isolated, those of you who feel that God has forgotten you and forsaken you, I want you to read Matthew chapter 28 and verse number 20. Matthew chapter 28 and verse number 20. And I know it, I can quote it by heart, but I want you to get it. I want you to get there. I want you to see what the scripture says. God, Jesus, before he left this earth, told them to go preach, to go teach, to make disciples. And here's what he said in verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And he said, and lo, I am with you always. He didn't say, I'm going to be with you when you come to church. He didn't say, I'm going to be with you when you, you, know, you have a you know, Bible study. No, he said, I am, I will be with you. I am with you always, even to the end of this age or the end of this world. Amen. That's the end of it. You're not alone. You may be locked down, but Christ is not locked out. He's in your heart. He lives in you. You know what the Bible said in Galatians 2.20? Paul ran into the church in Galatians said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm here to tell somebody he's alive. We celebrated Easter not so long ago, a few weeks ago. I'm here to remind somebody that he's risen and he's alive. I can tell you he's alive. I spoke to him this morning. I spoke to him of just a few minutes ago. I'm here to tell you he's alive and he's with you. The form of the Holy Spirit in your lockdown, 
and your stay at home and your shelter in and all your restriction. I want you to understand that God wants to accomplish through you. He wants to deliver you. And in case you figure why, I don't know the answer to that question. But what I do know is the book of Matthew. What I do know is Romans, rather. The book of Romans chapter 8, verse 28, which says, And we know, not if, not maybe, but confidently, and we know that all things work together for good. <laughs> to them that love the Lord, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Brothers, if you believe that scripture, I want you to know that your lockdown does not mean that you're locked out. You still have access to the throne room of God. He said, come now, come boldly to the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. I want to pray for you because I believe God's plan that he has for us. The plan that God has for us is a plan to prosper us. And I encourage you with these scriptures over and over again. I want you to understand that Israel as a nation or the Jewish uh, people were taken as captive. I mentioned this before. This is the final one. And they were debating. They were debating whether or not, you know, should we, you know, should we, you know, we can't, we're going to come back, you know, what are we going to do, God? You know, we, we're not sure. Um, we're, God, where are you? What's your, you know, they wanted to know. And the prophet Jeremiah, you know, wrote this scripture to them, you know, encouraging them, let them know, look, you're going to be there for a while. You're going to be there for 70 years. You know, I want you to take your sons and and give them and let them get married, your daughters to get married. I want you to, to, to plant, I want you to plant, and I want you to, to, I want you to do all these different things, and I want you to remember all this. And here's what God said, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Those are God's plans for you. COVID-19 is not going to destroy us. COVID-19 is not going to make us poor. Then you will call on me, God said, and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. If you have never given your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe this is the place, this is the assurance I have. I celebrated my spiritual birthday on May 11. In the year 1978, May 11, 1978, I gave my heart to the Lord. I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. It was the best decision I could ever make. I have ever made. And that is 42 years ago. I want to give you that opportunity to accept him now into your life. Will you bow your heads with me and say after me, Heavenly Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, I repent of my sins. And I accept Jesus Christ into my life as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you made that decision, just send me, just put it on, this, on send me a text, um, you know, just send it to New Hope Church of God, the New Hope Church of God. Um, you can just go ahead, it's right there in the information. Yeah, for those of you who want to start afresh, you know, we have an app and you can do that. Actually, I want to encourage members of New Hope to use your app. If you don't, if you have not yet downloaded, go ahead and do so now. And that app is called, you know, you text this uh, to 77977, I'll repeat that, 77977, you will text these two words, New Hope COG, which is one word, N-E-W-H-O-P-E-C-O-G, hit the space button, and then write these three letters, A-P-P, which is New Hope COG app. And when you hit send, you will get a response, just click on the response, it will download you will download it onto your smartphone or tablet and you'll be able to, to
to you know, connect with us. You'll be able to give online. You'll be able to do all those different things. And we can follow you. We'll give you scriptures. We'll be able to, one of our, our you know, outreach workers will be able to follow up with you. Our disciple leaders will be able to follow up with you during that time as well. I know I pray for those that are lost. But I also want to pray for those who are believers. I want you to say this prayer. Say this prayer after me today. If you listen to this broadcast and you were living in that world where so many believers are today, don't feel alone, don't feel that something wrong with your Christianity, it's just the reality. You're overwhelmed. You want to know when will it end. Now, we have not been that long into it compared to years that have talked about 70 years in captivity. The children of Israel were in Babylon. Say this prayer after me. Say, Heavenly Father, I ask of you today that you will use this COVID-19 pandemic to bring many souls into your kingdom. I pray for the conversion of my unsaved loved ones. I ask you, dear God, to use it to accomplish positive things in me. Allow me, God, to develop and demonstrate the fruit of long-suffering or patience. And Lord God, use it to accomplish kingdom things through me. I ask it in Jesus' name. And we say, amen. God bless you. I love you. I want you to know that you don't have any problem. All you need is really faith in God. I want you to know that God has already given you strength for this day. And he will give you bright new hope for your tomorrow. Until we meet again next time, I encourage you to join us at our early morning prayer. It's a spiritual workout. We go into the gym. Um, that is a spiritual gym. And we you know, expand our faith. We build on our faith. And we want you to join us every morning, 5.30 uh, Eastern Time. Um, the information is on the screen. You can certainly find that. And then on Wednesday nights, we have Bible study at 7 p.m. for about an hour and a half. It's interactive. You're not going to just be listening to me. You have an opportunity to ask questions. You have an opportunity to share your testimony in our spiritual work on Monday to Friday. And every Saturday, we have a program for men. Um, we call it Man Talk, Men Talking to Men. If you're a brother and you want to get information on that, just, you know, just put that information on the screen or just send us a text uh, and we will take, take a note of that. Um, until then, we want to say God bless you. Goodbye. Thank you.